So the purpose of this whole workshop is really to talk about the different types of activities needed to stay on the critical pathway to develop a product for patients. And navigating a pathway to product development can be very treacherous at times. And we really want to try and give you the tools, the information that will help you at least anticipate what some of the challenges might be in terms of scientific, technical, and regulatory and give you some um, reasonable, rational approaches and ideas about how to uh, mitigate some of the risks involved in trying to take your great idea towards and into the clinic. So we really do want to help you avoid uh, the so-called bumps in the pathway. And our overall goal is really to enable you to more effectively stay on the critical path to develop, a pro uh, to develop your, your product. So our objectives for this workshop are really to increase your understanding of the preclinical studies and manufacturing activities on the development pathway to develop a product for patient, to provide an opportunity to share lessons learned on the development pathway between those of you who have been previously funded and those of you who are more newly funded, so really try and exchange lessons learned between the alumni, so to speak, of people who already have been funded with CIRM and have been down that road, and maybe it's been bumpy at time, and there's lessons that you've learned along the way, as well as the neophyte, the newly funded, and, and try to do what we can so that those people don't go down the same blind alleys as much as possible. Because frankly, at the end of the day, we really do want to position you to be successful. Because if you're successful, CERM can be successful. And that's really good for the patients because we move the therapeutic approaches forward to people who really need them. We really also have a, a third objective for this workshop, and that's really to raise awareness about ways to engage in collaborative interactions for clinical trials with the UK. Um, there are members of the UK, um, both from the UK as well as um, regional um, individuals from San Francisco and also from Los Angeles who are in town this week and are very excited to be able to have an opportunity to talk with you about some of their programs and potential ways in which our investigators here in California may be able to interact with them. As you know, CIRM has over 22 memorandum of understanding with uh, funding agencies from around the world. For the UK uh, collaboration, we do have a funding agency that we're working with, the uh, Medical Research Council. So anyway, there are tangible ways to, to make integrated programs work. So we're very excited about that aspect of this workshop as well. This is showing you the speakers and agenda for today's workshop. I'll be setting the stage and trying to set some of the objectives and lessons learned. After me will come Dr. Keith Wells. He's senior consultant for Biologics Consulting Group. He's going to be talking about the manufacturing and regulatory issues on the development pathway. Following him will be Dr. Joy Cavanero. Um, she's president of Access Bio, has decades of experience running um, and evaluating preclinical toxicology uh, and other types of safety studies. Um, and so what she's going to be talking about are those types of studies, preclinical studies, to really optimize what you need to do for that first in human clinical trial. After each talk, there'll be uh, some time for Q&A, but then we'll also uh, have time after both their talks to go over some illustrative case studies and also questions at that time. And then at the end of this workshop at 4.30, we're going to have a talk by several members of the uh, UK group talking about clinical trials and opportunities for California re uh, researchers to collaborate with them. We'll have Drs. Christopher Bravery, who's Director of uh, <coughs> Consulting Advanced Biologicals, Dr. Matthew Halsworth, who's Head of Communications at the National Institute for Health Research, Office of Clinical Research Infrastructure, Dr. Natalie Mount, who's Chief Clinical Officer of Cell Therapy Catapult, and uh, Nicholas Cooper, Hooper, who's Head of Science and Innovation with the British Consulate General, in Los Angeles, and also Catherine Brown, who's a regional director here in San Francisco. I wanted to set the stage a little bit about this workshop and how it fits within the context of what we're trying to do at the Institute. 
And I think you're all aware of our vision and our mission, which is really to advance stem cell-based science towards, uh, towards clinical trials so that we have an opportunity to actually bring new, effective, potentially curative therapies mm -hmm. to patients. That's what we're all about, is trying to help patients enhance our knowledge, but at the end of the day, bring this knowledge to applications that can help patients. For the first five years, six years of CIRM's existence, there was a lot of focus on really um, cultivating the field, bringing in intellectual capital, building physical infrastructure, seeding the field with new ideas and new research. We're now in what we call the focus phase, this next five years, which is really to prioritize projects and investments to really drive that science towards clinical trials to show potential therapeutic benefit for patients and to develop partnerships across disciplines, across different universities, across different continents, and also with different types of interactions with industry. Because at the end of the day, we're going to be able to take the project only so far to actually take it all the way to commercialization and eventually into the marketplace. It's going to take some involvement with industry. And so we're trying right now to set up those types of engagements so that by 2016, we're really well poised to facilitate commercialization of therapies, to advance therapies to patients, and to have enabled a business model for stem cell-based therapies. So it's a very ambitious mission and a very ambitious vision. And we're really delighted to have such talented people in the room here who are helping move that mission forward. Our activities to date toward that mission are over 560 research and facility awards to over 60 institutes and companies, 12 new uh, research institutes and centers of regenerative medicine, over 1,200 major scientific papers published, over 130 new stem cell researchers who have come to California. And of those 560 awards, 77 of them are in what we call the translational portfolio. Those types of projects that are actually uh, working on developing that preclinical proof of concept, that are identifying those therapeutic candidates, and are going down the FDA IND regulatory pathway to get into clinical trials. So of those 77, we have 51 that are in what we call the early translation stage. 24 disease teams, and two strategic partners. So we've spent 1.7 billion in total, and about 675 million of that 1.7 have gone towards translational programs. Before I go any further, I just want to ask a question. How many in this audience are actually from the CIRM-funded early translation programs? Quite a few. How many are from the disease teams? And how many are from the strategic partnerships? OK, well, there's a small number of those. <laughs> All right. And how many of you, just because you're interested? OK, great. Well, welcome to all of you. This is a chevron showing the span of research that we engage in. And it's everywhere from the engine of discovery with basic research through to candidate discovery research, and then down that um, winding pathway to develop a therapeutic product for patients. So the preclinical research, the preclinical development, and the early phase clinical trials. And underneath that chevron, you see the different CIRM initiatives that we fund to make that hopefully a seamless pathway so that there's stepping stones to, from one project to the next that you can advance if you're making uh, the appropriate progress. So we have training programs for the intellectual capital, the basic research for the engine of discovery, the tools and technology to really address the challenges and the obstacles on the way to actually develop your project, maybe biomarkers, maybe assays, maybe imaging, maybe in-process manufacturing issues. But the tools and technologies you need to move forward, and then the early translation, and then the disease teams. It looks like that disease team has a really broad swath. That's because we've now had two cohorts with the first cohort, uh, we started pretty far back, almost in research. Uh, and now, as the field has advanced, the second cohort was actually starting at the IND enabling stage. And now, for that third cohort that's coming through, the expectation is that they'll really complete early stage clinical trials. And then, for the strategic partnerships, that's our engagement that's really focused on industry, either biotech or academics, that have a tie with industry that can help bring it all the way through, not just the early, but if milestones are met, 
have that commitment to take her farther along to the phase three clinical trial. This is just showing our disease team initiatives. We have about 25 programs to the tune of about 300 and about $440 million. This is showing you the broad spectrum of therapeutic areas that we engage in. We don't have a crystal ball. We don't know which particular therapeutic area might be the place to really go in. But we, because we were exploring a variety of areas, this is where we are right now. So this is a snapshot on time. What we hope to do as the years advance, the field matures even more, we'll be able to, to try and figure out if we can pick those winners as we move forward. These are the therapeutic modalities. Once again, we don't have a crystal ball. We don't know which particular modality might be the best one to go forward with. So we've invested in cell therapies, which are the pale blue, the gene-modified cell therapy, which is in the royal blue, the small molecules or the monoclonal antibodies that are really targeting uh, perhaps the cancer stem cell to actually attack the stem cell, or perhaps it's stimulating or catalyzing the proliferation of the endogenous stem cell for repair and regeneration. And then the um, red is the cell therapy combination product. It could be combined, say, with a device. And then the, the pale green, the little sliver of the pie, is the, are the projects that are focused on gene-modified cell therapy combination projects. We invest in allogeneic approaches, autologous approaches, and so we've, we've actually been quite um, broad in the types of therapeutic <laughs> modalities. With the first cohort of disease teams, what I can tell you, those just began funding in 2010, so they're, they're about 30 to 36 months into their progress. Over half of those disease team ones have successfully advanced through their pre-IND meeting with the FDA towards an approvable IND. One clinical trial is ready to start this year, and we expect one to two more this year. We anticipate five clinical trials by the end of next year. Five of the first cohort of disease teams have collaborative funding partners. One has a collaboration with a disease team. Two have companies that are either uh, have as the head uh, their principal investigator or as the co-principal investigator an industry uh, person, and two have founded companies on their own. There have been over 21 invention disclosures, 24 with active or pending patent applications, and 18 scientific <coughs> publications. I can tell you we are very excited about this progress because many of these <coughs> investigators are coming from academic environment where, frankly, developing a product is, is not the reason why they went to a university. It's usually getting grants. It's getting papers published. But developing a product is, is quite a culture change, and I think there's been a lot of progress made with all of your very strong work. One of the ways that we try and achieve that project, uh, that progress is, is, first of all, it has to be driven by the science and the evidence needed for progressing down the regulatory pathway. In order to try and make that happen, prior to any money going out the door, we work with the investigator to mutually agree on go, no, go, progress, milestones, and then the success criteria to achieve them. So it's an interactive, collaborative uh, dialogue before any money even goes out the door. And then during the conduct of the research, there's interactive, ongoing discussions between the CIRM scientists and the funded research team. There's updates on interval progress on a biannual to a quarterly basis and overall annual progress updates. And then there are clinical development advisor meetings at least once a year at their key milestones. For the first cohort of disease teams, we've already had two of those advisory panels. Panels They consist of expertise cumulatively across preclinical, uh, manufacturing, regulatory, clinical, disease states, uh, commercial um, viability issues. So all the experts sitting around uh, the table for an in-person meeting to work with that team to try and give them the advice they can to help position them for success. In addition to that, we work extensively with the Food and Drug Administration and put on webinars, roundtables, conferences, and seminars. And then for those who aren't able to attend or participate, we also try and put what we can on our public website so that we can try and disseminate that information to others and increase the knowledge base. So uh, as I said, we have expert advisors who are alert, want to listen to the teams, and really try and help them. 
Uh, we have vigorous discussions, but at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is position our teams to be successful. And I think we've seen a real um, even maturation of the meetings with our disease teams and our advisors. I think first it was a bit of deer uh, in front of the headlights um, because there was uh, anxiety about having to present things, including the blemishes and the flaws. But what we came to a conclusion, mutually agreed, is that the more you share, the more we can understand and try to help you. And that really has evolved to a very nice way, I think, with all of the teams <coughs> at this point in time. Um, this workshop is one of a series that we've had over the years. We had a target product uh, profile workshop back at the last grantee workshop in 2011. There, what we were really trying to focus on is you have to know where you're going if you want to design your um, preclinical and all your manufacturing activities in the right way. If you don't know where you're headed, it's really hard to know if you've gotten there. So what we were really trying to stress is have the end goal in mind before you even get started. So some of the take-homes from that workshop is that successful product development commercialization needs to be label-driven. What do you want to see on the label of that product? And question-based, that one of the tools that we um, presented at that workshop and we've encouraged all of our investigators to use is the target product profile, really your aspirational goals for where that uh, product could be placed in the marketplace and the attributes that you want them to have and to develop that um, in advance to drive your product development. So starting with that end in mind. That document is actually a living document. It gets refined as the data comes in and then you refine the document. So it changes over time as the data accumulates. What we really put forth at that workshop was that criteria, criteria had to be pre-specified and measurable for what you consider the optimal and minimal threshold, what's the acceptable target differentiation for market advantage for your therapeutic product, to have that in mind, not to draw the bullseye after you shoot the arrows, but actually have a sense of what you want to obtain before you shoot that arrow. And really to use it as a tool to facilitate the efficiency of the investigator, FDA interactions and communication to help maintain focus which really is hard to do. There's so many exciting places you could go with the research, but try and maintain that focus on the labeling goals and really use it as a tool to help address issues early in the process, therefore trying to prevent late stage failures and decreasing the total product development time. So once again, knowing where you'd like to go is really key in product development. <coughs> and we hope that this workshop will be one of many that will be informative and help guide your project. We probably spend more than a nickel on regulatory <laughs> advice, don't we? <laughs> These are some CERM templates to guide your product development. There's other websites that you also may find useful. And I just want to add at this point, all of our presentation slides are going to be available on our public website. So uh, within a few weeks after the workshop. So you'll, you'll have a chance to, to see all of this. Thank you.